Back in the mid-1980s, I was going through kind of a late-in-life renaissance, and I started reading a lot of biographies. The reading of these biographies inspired me to do something with my life. I felt like, what am I doing uh, that's going to last? Am I doing, do I have any lasting legacy going on here? I had a full-time job, and I was commuting 90 minutes one way in L.A. traffic to work. I had absolutely no available time to read. So I took matters into my own hand and started reading while driving five miles an hour on the freeways. I got into a few fender benders going at five or 10 miles an hour. A friend actually brought me a book on tape. It was uh, eight tapes. It was the book 1984 by George Orwell. And during the next few days, I listened to it on my commute. And I thought, why doesn't everyone in the world who's sitting on these freeways, why don't they listen to audiobooks? Because I have a, a wife who's always wanted to follow my dreams. Three years later, when I went to her and said, Michelle, what do you think of doing our own business, becoming an audiobook publisher? She heartily said, yes, let's do it. And we sold our house in Southern California and moved to Oregon, and the rest is history. So one thing comes into mind when I think about those early days, and that is stress. People really don't understand what I went through until I tell them that I worked over 100 hours a week for the first five years. I did almost everything in the business. My, my wife helped out with some of the proofing and answering some phones on occasion, but otherwise I did it all. I, I mean, I licensed the titles, I wrote the copy, I placed the edits into the recordings, I did the data entry for orders, and uh, probably the best thing I did was I actually got on the phone with customers and I took orders. And then fast forward about two years when we did have some employees, we might have had a half dozen employees, we had converted our garage into kind of a semi warehouse uh, phone center. So we had like four little cubicles where people could take phone calls and the rest was just inventory and people, you know, stuffing books and this and that. In the early days, when we were really struggling, we got so financially pinched at one time, I actually auditioned myself. And I'll never forget this. I read two pages in my audition, and then I listened back, and I've never been tempted to read since. It was so bad. So I, I, I've gained a tremendous respect for uh, the art of narration. It's, it's not easy. So a story that often comes up around the dinner table about Blackstone may be the one that concerns the etymology of our name, how we came up with the Blackstone name. There was a great literary magazine in England back in the 18th century called Blackstone. And so we ran that by everybody and it had a nice lilt to it, so we decided to go with it. Well, <laughs> That was all fine and dandy, but about three years later, I was over in London having lunch with Jack Muggridge, who was the brother of Malcolm Muggridge, one of my favorite authors. And Jack asked, you know, how did you come up with Blackstone? I told him the story, and he stopped me and said, Craig, the magazine that you're referring to was not Blackstone, it was Blackwell. So, uh, I guess we missed it on that, but he did tell me that Blackstone was the great uh, legal mind that uh, influenced their law even today. Back in the cassette day, we were forced to really rent our books more than even uh, selling them because of the price. So a book like Atlas Shrugged was 35 tapes and the cost was $200. But I'd say most of all as a publisher, my frustration with tapes was the price we had to we, we really couldn't sell them at a reasonable price. You could buy the hardback for much less than you could buy the audio version. So needless to say, when the, when the download came around, we were quite elated, and, uh, and now we're able to sell books at a very reasonable price. Last year, we launched a full-service publishing division, meaning we publish print books, paperbacks, hardbacks, e-books, audiobooks, and we're in the process of developing what we are calling the hybrid book. The hybrid book 
is a book that can be listened to and read at the same time. So it's really an ebook that is time stamped with the audio so that a person can actually listen and read at the same time. And you might say, well, why would a person want to do that? Studies show that people who read and listen at the same time improve their retention and comprehension significantly. The culture of Blackstone is what I would call uh, counter-corporate. I decided to give our people a lot of freedom, so the people here pretty much can make their schedules, but we also give them a lot of freedom to accomplish what they can accomplish. I just think that if you don't give people freedom, you'll never see what they can do. And I think it all, it just, it just works for the area. Ashland is a kind of a rural area, beautiful Southern Oregon, and, uh, and people like living here and like working here. My advice for others who want to start a business that can be sustainable for a long period of time and grow, I suppose would be to find a product that helps people in some way. Find a product that either improves their education, uh, their health, their personal growth or spiritual growth, or in our case, a product that does all those and gives them uh, the gift of time. But if you can do something that will help people, it's probably going to endure for a long, long time.